in conversation about the impact of mass incarceration in local communities and invites residents to use the arts and humanities to devise strategies toward a truly just society. We're pleased to bring you this program today in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's Department of Exhibitions and Exhibition Studies, which brings to Chicago audiences the work of acclaimed and emerging artists while providing SAIC and the public opportunities for direct involvement in exchange with the discourses of art today. Before I introduce you to our incredible panelists and moderator, I'm gonna hand it off to my fabulous colleague, Tyrese Williams, who has some quick tips for an optimal Zoom experience with us today. Tyrese? Uh, yeah, thank you, Jane. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Tyrese Williams and I'm the project manager for Envisioning Justice. Um, and as Jane mentioned, I'm just gonna share a few little Zoom tips for everybody um, as we uh, transition into the program. Um, I'm sure you've probably already noticed, but um, all of you are muted um, and you will be muted for the entirety of the program. Um, this program is also gonna be recorded. Um, and so depending on your comfortability level, feel free to turn your camera on or off. Um, it's, it's completely up to you. Um, we do also have closed captions available for this event. Um, and so if you would like closed captions, um, if you look down at the bottom of, the, of your screen, um, if, there should be a CC icon. Um, if you click that, um, caption should be appearing um, as I speak. Um, and then there will also be a Q&A portion of today's event. Uh, and for the Q&A portion, Jane will probably share a little bit more about that later. Um, we, we ask that you hold any questions that arise during the event until kind of, kind of the end, until, until we transition into the q and I'm sorry. Um, but feel free to use the chat um, and react to anything that you hear um, throughout the program. Um, but with that being said, we do have a couple of community agreements that we ask folks to follow um, at all of the events uh, th that we host. And I will drop those in the chat in just a second. Oh no, just kidding. Jane dropped them in the chat. Um, you, you should see those uh, lovely agreements uh, right there. And I think that's about it as far as Zoom goes. Uh, if you have any questions or are having any, any difficulties, uh, feel free to chat me private, privately. You do have that option. Um, yeah, and I'll just pass it over back to Jane to keep us moving. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tyrese. Um, wonderful. So it has really been a profound honor at Illinois Humanities to be a grantee of the Art for Justice Fund, a sponsored project of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. Um, if you watch the film, and I see some of you in the chat already saying that you have, of course, um, if you watch the film that we're here to discuss today, you know a little bit about why the fund is so special and what kind of community it has helped to cultivate. Um, we have several members of that beloved Art for Justice community here with us as panelists today. And I wanna tell you a little bit about them before I hand off the digital floor. Um, and if you, if panelists, if you would wave uh, when I say your name, that would be great. Catherine Gund is not only the filmmaker behind Aggie, but the daughter of Aggie or Agnes Gund herself. She's also the founder of Aubin Pictures an Emmy nominated producer, director, writer, and activist, and a governing board member of the Art for Justice Fund. Maria Gaspar is an interdisciplinary artist whose work addresses issues of spatial justice in order to amplify, mobilize, or divert structures of power through individual and collective gestures. Maria is also a faculty member at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and we at Illinois Humanities were really honored to feature some of her work with the radioactive ensemble inside Cook County Jail in our Envisioning Justice exhibition last fall. Terrence Bogans is the program officer for the criminal justice strategy of the Art for Justice Fund. Terrence comes to the fund after years of both direct representation and policy level advocacy within the criminal justice reform space. Most recently, Terrence was Director of Bail Operations at the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, a nonprofit organization that pays bail for low-income New Yorkers. And Zyveria Simmons' sweeping body of work 
includes photography, performance, choreography, video, sound, sculpture, and installation. Simmons works are in major museum and private collections throughout the country. And in 2021 alone, she will have works on view at Socrates Sculpture Park in New York City, Times Square in New York City, Columbia University in New York City, and the Moody Gallery at Rice University, among many other exhibitions. And today's moderator, the wonderful Mei Hong, not only leads the Chicago Office of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, where she's responsible for serving individual donors, families, foundations, and corporations throughout the Midwest, but she's also our own board chair at Illinois Humanities. May, thank you so much for moderating today's discussion. And with that, I hand it off to you. All right, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you, good afternoon or good morning to all of you, wherever you are. All of us are just incredibly moved and honored that you would take time out of your day in these remarkable times we find ourselves in to be a part of this. And we, um, you know, we really want this to be an interactive, immersive experience for all of you, which is why we, um, you know, wanted everybody to be on camera and not have this feel like you were just watching this one-way presentation. So we hope you'll bring all of that energy and enthusiasm and um, insight to our conversation today. So please feel free to be active in the chat. If you hear something that you like, if you want to just plus one or tweet or do what we would have done um, if we were in an auditorium together having watched the film and having this um, this robust conversation. So let's dive right in. And our first question is for Kat. So first of all, Kat, um, why did you make this film? Uh, who is it for and why now? Um. <clears throat> It's really great to be here. I want to say how uh, proud and excited I am to be part of the Art for Justice beloved community of artists, activists, advocates, philanthropists, um, participant donors, everybody. And that, you know, the panel we have today is so representative of that. And I love what James said at the beginning. And this actually is part of my answer to the question of why I made the movie because my mother obviously has been my mother my entire life. Um, and I've been a filmmaker for 35 of my 36 years. <laughs> um, and people had said before, you know, please make a movie about your mother or when are you gonna make a movie about your mother? And I always thought, you know, I love her, but no one else needs to really know about her. And then she did this miraculous thing in my opinion, which is that she, crossed all of her own bounds about how she understood um, art and interacted with art in her world. And she sold this beloved painting. Um, and I hope everybody's seen the film. Thank you for your comments in the chat from the people who have, but you know how she sees the world through art. And when she sold that painting, it wasn't to engage in a transactional sort of art as investment, art as capital move, in my opinion, it was really the intention behind it, which Edgar Villanueva speaks about. Um, James Baldwin has talked about that. What does it mean to sell the painting with the intention of ending mass incarceration? It wasn't, how am I going to get money? And then how am I going to spend it on myself? She had a full plan from the beginning. And when she did that, I thought more people should do it. I thought it was amazing and it is unique. And to me, it seemed really, really obvious. And I thought, why is it so unique if it's so obvious? And I thought this would be an opportunity not only to increase conversation about criminal justice reform and actually finally ending mass incarceration and not allowing a new version of the legacy of slavery to take its place in some slightly changed form, but to actually have that conversation. And so I made the movie, but I would never have had any idea that it would come out at this particular time. And this time is, is one in which this reckoning is getting a broader platform. More people are open, more people are noticing. And to me, that's always been about artists being able to be those visionaries. Um, and, and, and I think that Aggie's relationship with art and artists, you know from the film that she does care less about the piece of art than she does about the artist. And living in a world where artists can survive and thrive and are celebrated and centered and their leadership is recognized and their visions are, are part of everybody's common language. Um, 
So I wanted all of that to happen and then this happens now. Um, and, and we're in this moment where I think more and more people are recognizing not only that there's no truth, um, because I'm a good semiotics student from Brown University, I know there is no like essential meaning, but just really that we do need to embrace this uncertainty and we're all having to do that and with great harm in some cases now. So I don't think it's a miraculous sort of, um, you know, silver lining moment. But I do think that this notion that there is not a set truth and that we're actually making that together allows for more voices to be included. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it, to me, it couldn't have come out at a better time and, and I couldn't be surrounded by smarter, more visionary people in trying to figure out the path forward. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, at least you won't have people asking you anymore. When are you going to make a movie about your mother? <laughs> so, although there are so many questions I'm sure people have actually about what that was like. Um, and we will come back to that in a second. But we want to hear about the impact that this extraordinary gesture has had. So let's actually hear from the artists, Maria and Zyveria. You've both been artists and activists for a long time. But what did it mean to you to receive Art for Justice funding for your work in this moment right now? Maria, why don't we start with you? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this uh, conversation with some really incredible people. And I know there's a lot of wonderful people in this room and also want to recognize that um, I see a lot of artists and activists, uh, uh, especially uh, here based in Chicago, that uh, I'm sure have a lot of great things to add to the conversation. Um, yeah, you know, I, I received uh, the gift of the Art for Justice Fund several years ago and you know, it, it, it came at a time when um, I was beginning to kind of shift my practice from working outside of Cook County Jail uh, in Chicago for many years and doing kind of arts and uh, arts uh, and installation um, to then working inside of the um, uh, jail and working with incarcerated people. You know, I grew up a few blocks away from Cook County Jail and um, have been working with lots of people to really think about how um, the jail is a kind of centerpiece inside of an urban center um, and how the jail has sort of been normalized and how many jails and prisons are normalized. And so thinking about how this place is both visible and invisible became a kind of starting point for the work I began doing. Um, you know, I think art has the power to create culture as we've seen and culture has the power to influence social movements. And I think I think artists have always known that. And I, I think sort of this moment that we're in, the urgency of this time has, um, I think, uh, really impacted artists and, and gotten them to really think about, you know, uh, protest, um, public action as a space for imagination, um, when a time that we needed the most to really reimagine systems of power. Um, so it's been, you know, truly a gift, uh, you know, to to receive this, um, you know, award, and also to really, you know, kind of think about what is it, what does it mean to be doing very intimate work with others um, in in a time of social distance? You know, what does it look like to do social practice during social distance? And that has been sort of the the next challenge that I've been kind of thinking through as we look at jails and prisons as COVID hotspots, uh, including Cook County Jail. Thank Hi, you, Maria. Siberia. Yeah, it's so nice to see everyone. I see so many of my friends. I want to give special love to Leanne, who like facilitates so much, and we talk to her all the time. Um, you know, for me, it's it's been such a dream, joy, pleasure to um, be a part of the Art for Justice community, um, to learn, you know, there's things that you know as an artist and things that you intuit, but you don't, you're not necessarily um, taken care of by that intuition and by those things. And so it's been really amazing to be a part of a community that's interested in the impact of, you know, the history of this country, but also the impact of the artist as an activist. And I feel like, you know, receiving the resources is, is one step because it's helped me to, you know, spend a lot of time thinking, almost monk-like, thinking about all of the threads that have led you know, to where we are today, you know, because when we received the resources, 
um, from our for justice, you know, we weren't at this reckoning, you know, there was no way to know we were at this moment. And we've all been preparing and prepared to face this moment in different ways because of the conversations, the holistic way in which, you know, all of the parties who've, who've gathered the resources and the community together have taken care to make us prepared for this moment and, and with, with financial support, but also with intellectual support, with spiritual support. Um, and for me particularly, um, I'm from New York City. I grew up, um, I was a punk rocker and a metalhead, <laughs> which is not something that people know. But when you are a punk rocker and a metalhead, when you're like 12 and 10, you know, you are inherently an activist. So I've always been an artist. My parents never, um, my, I've realized that I come from activist family. My whole family is pretty much act, have been activists in different ways. My mother was a Buddhist, you know, before it was cute. Um, my, my grandmother was heavily involved in the church, but as a, as a radical, you know, reckoning, uh, a reckoning, a black reckoning, you know, it wasn't just like, you know, church for church sake, it was also a holistic, you know, kind of way of living in the black church. So for me, you know, being an art for justice grantee is, is a meeting of myself fully so that I can make beautiful objects because that is what I'm trained to do as an artist in a way. And I also can make very critically engaged works. And I'm, I'm backed by knowledge and data and research and conversation and nourishment from the community. So for me, you know, it's been life changing. My whole studio is, I mean, this is like, you know, uh, my whole studio is basically art for justice, really. You know, I mean, I still, you know, engage in other practices, but I am deeply committed to the transformation of this country. And so the resources have helped my studio practice to really go deeper in and, mm -hmm that's a meeting of the self because I've been active this entire time as an activist since I was like 12 years old. Wonderful, wow, thanks. There's so many threads we could follow in what both of you have just shared, but let's bring Terrence into the conversation. Terrence, you sit at this really unique place so right between the resources of what Aggie's gift allowed to happen and then finding and scouting and supporting great artists like Maria and Zyveria. Um, tell us about some of the impact that the other Art for Justice grantees have been able to have on actually ending mass incarceration. Yeah, sure. Um, and I'll just quickly, you know, echo what everyone said before me. Thank you all for being here. It's always an honor um, to share space with this community. Um, but yeah, you know, I think, you know, our grantees have done tremendous work that has truly shifted uh, the landscape of mass incarceration, you know, being a five year spin down fund, Agnes and Kat and everyone um, who helped create the fund had a vision of making a huge impact over a short period of time that would also have long term ramifications. So, you know, we've seen big wins with Desmond Mead and the FRRC with Amendment 4 in Florida, which was in the film. Um, you know, we've seen huge bail reform wins in New York and Texas. Uh, the Youth First Initiative has successfully advocated to close juvenile jails across the country, actually led by young folks who were incarcerated in some of these very juvenile facilities. Um, and, you know, we're currently working on important ballot measures as the electioneers in both California and Oregon. So lots of moving parts. Um, but, you know, I, I believe our true impact comes from the community um, of the, you know, the community of organizations, advocates and artists, uh, you know, that we've been able to help foster and that, you know, we're a part of. So, for example, um, the Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth, who's a grantee partner that was also featured in the film, you know, not only have they done massive work to end juvenile life without parole in almost 30 states now, uh, but around this time last year, I was actually had the opportunity to attend their convening in Montgomery, Alabama, that was centered around another initiative that we were able to help fund um, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice and the Legacy Museum created by Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, which, you know, of course, outlines our country's history and evolution from slavery to mass incarceration and commemorates, you know, those who were lynched in the post slavery era. And so, you know, not only were we convened in Montgomery to discuss important policy work led by a national network 
of folks who, you know, have been sentenced to die in prison as children who are now on the outside, you know, becoming advocates, still fighting, you know, for the folks who are on the inside. Um, but we also had the opportunity to uh, be there in, in this crucial sort of context um, of, uh, of the shared experience uh, provided by the artwork, right, in the museum and at the memorial. So, you know, I, I believe the fund's true sweet spot or our magic is when we can help facilitate or join these types of collaborations that bring together both, you know, these tremendous groups of advocates and also have, you know, the art itself be the force or power um, that truly ties the work itself together. You know, I believe that's our real alchemy within, you know, a for j is the community that we, you know, we, uh, you know, help be create uh, and then, you know, that we're a part of. And I think that is what will live past the fund and continue to make impact for years to come. I love that. Thank you, Terrence. Alchemy of the community. That should be like a new tagline or hashtag somewhere. That's beautiful. I mean, literally, you are sharing examples of how art changes everything, which was the title of this program, but how it's having a direct impact on changing, changing lives at a very real level. Um, Kat, you know, I want to go back to you and the opening line in the film that um, appears from Ava DuVernay, which is um, art and just art and justice both require imagination. Tell us a little bit about what that means. I didn't get that right, but you can, uh, it's art requires imagination and justice does as well. Unpack that for us in how your mother saw the two as being intertwined. Um, so much of the attention is on the painting and the sale of it, but your mom saw that for decades through everything she did. I think that's absolutely right. And when I sat with Ava, I asked her what the relationship between art and justice was. And I bookend the film with her at the beginning, it's in text part of the hers, and at the end you hear her whole statement. And it's art that, you know, that the art and justice are the same thing. They're both about the imagination. They're both about seeing something that doesn't exist, whether it's abolition or justice or something on a blank canvas or something on a blank page of a book um, and believing that it can be and then working to make it so. And I've learned so much from Art for Justice and from Aggie, but part of what I learned from Aggie is to listen to other people. And so that's where a lot of the Art for Justice community comes in. And, you know, like how do we let ourselves see something bigger, see something different, see something better? Um, and then what are actual steps in, in getting there? And I feel like, you know, people see in the film, um, well, first, I would say that part of the timeliness, and we're all touching on it right now, is just that, that and, it, and it's so true in this moment, is that artists are activists, and activists are artists. It's not two different people. Um, and that every one of us has the potential, you know, obviously, some prioritize one part of that. It's not like all artists are brilliant <laughs> or brilliant people um, whose um, heart is on the right side of history or, or, or vice versa. But that there is a way that people can allow themselves to access and tap into that commonality. That commonality. And so when Terrence was talking, it's not just bringing together artists and activists, it's actually allowing the artistry of their activism and the activism inside their artistry to flourish. Um, and I would add to that during COVID that some of the beautiful response we saw from so many people was in mutual aid. And that a lot of people were tapping into the fact that they have what other people need whatever that might look like, or they have the wherewithal and resourcefulness to go find it or to identify it and get it to people, whether that's food or shelter or love or connection, um, spirituality, whatever it is. And I think that notion of mutual aid also allows more people to kind of have that third leg of the stool we talk about in Art for Justice, which is artist advocates and allied donors, and that everyone can be all three of those things. Um, and then um, I was about to say something about some, oh, that I do feel also that part of what we're talking about in making those steps and taking those, making sense of this notion that art and activism are the same thing and they're about imagination really is about acknowledging the importance of healing right now. And I wouldn't say that was on our number one sort of first paragraph about how we were conceiving art for justice day one, but it's become so clear 
that this exact reckoning that's happening to the whole country is happening to us in neighborhoods and families and communities and prisons and jails and detention centers, that there has to be a healing in order to make a future harm impossible. That we can't just imagine forward and say, oh, let's just get rid of all the prisons and get rid of all the police, even though I'm for both of those things. Um, but we have to figure out how we're gonna get there. And to do that, we have to heal what's already happened in order to go forward. And so I feel like for Aggie, it's really those networks of care, which is what we're talking about as this community of art for justice, is that it's that which became clear to me is really about who she is, that she's connected to this whole community. She's most uh, exuberant, most in love, most wants to be a better person when she's in relationship and in communication with others. And that's part of why I, I did the conversation instead of a talking head conversation. So you see her in conversation with Zyveria and with many other artists and colleagues and friends and relatives, my four children, so that it became kind of a prismatic experience of who she is. There were all these different facets of her. So I feel like you know, and Ava's one of those people who's had an enormous influence on her. And, it, and Ava did that through art. So, you know, to me, Ava was the perfect person to help us understand what seeing through art for Aggie really means and how that translates into activism. Mm. Great, great, thank you, thank you. Well, you mentioned uh, Zyveria being in the film and we wanna hear from Zyveria. You're in the film, you clearly have a very close relationship with Aggie. From the artist's perspective, how do you see the relationship between the artist, the activist and the philanthropist? That three-legged stool that Kat just referenced. You know, I love that question because, you know, I think a lot about, so, I think a lot about repetition in in relationships, and I think about a lot of a, a lot about repetition repetition in terms of building narratives and in building history, and also in building artworks and building an artist studio. And the beautiful thing about, first of all, about the Art for Justice community is that we have continuous conversations and those conversations overlap in repetitive ways sometimes where we're saying similar things over and over again to each other so that we understand what's at stake and what needs to happen. Now I'm going to tease and so that happens inside of my studio practice of course like I'm looking at things over and over again and trying to see how to embed those those politics into material form with Aggie, with Catherine, with the family, um, there's a repetition in the relationships. And what I mean by that is that there, with repetition comes comfort, with repetition comes care, with repetition comes the ability to speak more truth like any family, right? So I'm able, because we've been friends for quite a while now because of my practice and because of Aggie's collecting, um, I've been able to be repetitively inside of, you know, conversations with all the different parts of, of the group of the family. And um, as a result, there's a level of comfort that has occurred over many, many years. And that level of comfort allows for these difficult conversations where we can talk about the history of the United States, where we can talk about the fact that the country is built on indigenous land, where we can talk about the fact that our country has incarcerated more people than anywhere else on the planet, where we can talk about the fact that there is a need for repair and reparations. All of those things, difficult as they may, have started to become normal, almost like brushing your teeth conversations with Aggie, with Kat, with the whole entire Art for Justice community. And that's because the conversations have been nurtured through repetition. And so this is something that I wanna offer actually to younger artists also um, in, in, in relationship to looking at Aggie and thinking about the film and thinking about the characters inside is that you, you can't be afraid to look at this history and and realize that it's taken about 400 years to build this narrative. So it's gonna take us quite a while to undo some of this. And the, the way that you undo is through difficult conversations with family members, difficult art viewing sessions with friends, 
understanding the history of the country, understanding what resources you may have that you might be able to shift, share, give up, what risks are you willing to take? And all of that has to be built in a, in a community of care. Um, if you can, whatever community, whether it's your home care, when it's just you and you build it, or it's, it's as you reach out. So for me, you know, it's, of course, when Aggie first came to my studio 15 years ago, first it, it gave Kat a photograph of mine that her children have seen for like 15 years that's above their television. Of course, it was intimidating. It's like, oh my God, it's, this is her. Like she's the, she's the grand dame. If, you, if you've watched Real Housewives, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> she's the grand dame, right? And then all of a sudden it's like, I'm like, Aggie, you go out more than me. And then it's like, are you dating? You know what I'm saying? Like it take, and then it, and then it, and then it's like, cat. We are literally standing inside of a maximum security prison, trying to understand how we are going to make image, sound, video, uh, action against understand abolition of this place. That all started with Aggie calling me 15 years ago asking for an image for her daughter who I didn't know at the time. So it's, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. And it's, and it's, and, and I will end to say it's all, it's a very graceful, even though it's been difficult to build that comfort, it's something we all have to do. And it's because Aggie is very graceful. She's Midwestern and beautiful and graceful it's allowed for all of us to have these really difficult conversations around resources and around our country's history, around whiteness, around blackness, around indigeneity. It's complicated, but we all have to breathe into the repetition of building these conversations so that we can move forward or through. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zyveria. Um, I want to just pause for a minute and say we're just a couple of questions away from opening it up to you all for your questions. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat for any of our panelists. Um, we just want to hear from Maria and Terrence one more time. Um, Maria, one of the things that struck me about what Zyveria just said, as she mentions repetition, relationship, comfort, you know, I think of the word proximity. And that's been a big part of your work because you work directly with incarcerated people in uh, the creation of your work. Um, how does that inform your creative process and how has that led you to where you are today? Um, yeah, thank, thanks for that question. I mean, I think, um, you know, based on what Zavidia, Zavidia just said um, about kind of understanding the landscape uh, is really important. The sort of social landscape, the historical landscape that we are currently existing in is really key. Um, when I, you know, uh, have uh, worked inside of mostly jails, I really think about understanding that landscape, the people, the institution, but also um, the, 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 the feeling, right? The, the psychological impact, um, the way uh, one enters a space and exits, um, the, uh, the way that, you know, the walls exist within a place and the hauntings um, that exists in a place of incarceration. And, and so, you know, I, I try my hardest to kind of think through um, that space of confinement, right? And, and how it impacts people. Um, you know, I've mostly worked in jails and these are places where people are awaiting trial. And so there's this element of um, anxiety around trial and waiting um, and, and not really having anything to do um, because these places are, you know, don't have anything really to offer in terms of, you know, intellectual stimulation, cre creative stimulation. And so I, I, ha I have to really come in with this understanding that the stakes are high. You know, it's, you know, I also make discrete objects, you know, I make sculptures, but it is an entirely different process. You know, the stakes um, are very different. When I'm working with people, especially people that have been historically marginalized, I think about um, you know, that the risks that I take in my studio are entirely different than the ones I might take creatively with a group of people. So that's really important. Um, I also think a lot about, um, you know, when Nicole Fleetwood, you know, describes as penal time and penal space about how it's an entirely different kind of construct of space and time. 
Um, and, you know, I think what has influenced me the most is the way that, uh, you know, in, in my experience, the way that um, our group has been able to somehow, <laughs> you know, within a place of a confinement, within a place of oppression, that one through art and, and through this sort of collective activity that we can kind of transform um, the, the, the sort of physicality, the, the, the psychic space um, that is, uh, is often dominating um, us. And so that process for me has been really powerful, especially as somebody who has been teaching for so long. And I think a lot about, you know, like the, the pedagogical aspect in my artwork and how important that is. And the space of exchange is so key in making work with others. And, you know, really our goal has been for a long time is like, how do we make these walls porous? You know, how do we make these walls come down? How do we make, you know, holes in these walls, right? And that has been somewhat of a, a challenge for us that through art, um, you know, we can make these walls porous. And, and lastly, I would say that, um, you know, it is, I think it is so much, uh, what was already said, it's so much about tenderness and love, you know, and, and kinship and, and the sort of love one creates in community that, as was already mentioned, is about an evolving process, right? It's, it, it changes, it evolves, um, it's hard, um, you know, some moments are a little bit easier, but that we can acknowledge that, you know, we're sort of on this journey together and, and you know, and that it's going to take time, so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Wow. A lot of good reactions coming to everything everybody is saying um, through the chat. So definitely a lot resonating with a lot of people. That's actually a perfect segue for my next question for Terrence, which is, you know, Terrence, what are some of the lessons learned through the Art for Justice Fund about why art is such a different kind of tool for change compared to like policy or research or organizing? What is Art for Justice showing you about what makes art so powerful? Yeah, you know, I, I thank you for the question. I think, you know, art is so powerful and it, it's so clear by, you know, the folks on the panel who just were speaking, right? Like it is truly a transformative practice. And we just heard a ton of, uh, you know, great examples of that. And each of these artists live that, you know, in their practice. Um, and, you know, Maria referenced this. In order for there to be real social change, we need both the law and the culture to shift, um, you know, in order to support lasting policy change. And so, you know, we've quickly learned that those organizations or those individuals who commit to both are the ones that make the biggest impact, right? Like even when starting the fund, even though we knew it on an intellectual level, I believe our grant making, you know, kind of had artists over here in this bucket and policy advocates over here in this bucket. But in reality, you know, like Kat said, you know, the same person can wear all of those hats and, you know, the work doesn't come together um, unless, unless that happens, you know, to move the entire movement forward. So, you know, in thinking about art as a tool, you know, organizations and certainly philanthropy, you know, can struggle to envision its impact sometimes because it doesn't have the same set of traditional metrics and statistics, you know, that we're all accustomed to seeing in that world, you know, how we evaluate policy um, and organize and work. So, you know, it, it takes a little bit of uh, effort to, to understand and recognize that within our grant making. Um, and, you know, I think just for a quick example, um, you know, we had the opportunity to fund the very first artist in residency program that was housed within a district attorney's office. And, you know, that happened in Philly um, with, you know, their DA Larry Krasner. Um, you know, who's known for, you know, his progressive work. And, you know, they brought in, you know, artist um, James Yaya Huff, who's formerly incarcerated, who spent 23 years in prison. Um, and, and, you know, he came out and like, and joined the DA's office to lead their artwork. Um, and, you know, when the idea was first pitched, I think even the district attorney's office really didn't have a, like any idea on, you know, what, what Yaya would do and, and, and how his art would, support the work that they were already doing. And I think like, you know, they're a great example because in what within such a short period of time, they recognized that that art component of the work um, took off and, you know, reached the community in ways that frankly, you know, the office had never been able to do uh, before. And so and if you ask them now, the DA's office, you know, they, they can't imagine the office or the work existing without that art component. And it's no longer a component, right? Like it is a part of the work. Um, and, and they've seen how impactful and how necessary it is to make that lasting social and policy change. 
May, can I just add one thing to that? Brilliant. Of course. It's such a perfect example, Terrence. I'm so glad you're talking about it for all the reasons you said. But one thing that made it really clear to me, I was so excited. I was like, oh, he just got out and he's going to be able to be in this office and change the way they think of someone who was formerly incarcerated and acknowledge that some people are artists, formerly incarcerated or not. But one thing that drove it home to me was when, um, when the DA spoke about the difference between having wanted posters on the wall and having paintings of the people who come through and also work in that space. So judges, um, people who have cases, uh, lawyers, and there were paintings of them instead of this totally alienating, horrifying, and also hammering home about the wrong narrative, the bad, you know, criminalizing narrative. And instead there was this artwork, but it also an acknowledgement of people. Anyway, it's the perfect example, Terrence. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you for sharing. And I saw that there have been some links posted in the chat, so feel free to check those out. So final question for all of you, and then we're gonna take the audience questions. Um, in just a few brief words, what do all of you see as the call to action coming out of the film? Uh, especially just given the moment we're in with everything that 2020 has wrought. Um, Kat, why don't we start with you? Oh, um, well, I would step back one tiny bit to say that the call to action to me doesn't come just from the making of Art for Justice or just from the moment we're in, you know, or just from seeing 13th. Like it was very clear for, to me that I knew my mother. It's not like that night, you know, she realized or learned something she didn't know before. It was a, it was a tipping point. There was an epiphany about her agency and her ability to participate. And that was what I wanted to focus on, not this idea that she went from being totally naive and ignorant into somebody who could do something like that. And I think we're all on, it's not a continuum, but you know, a soup. Um, and for the example for that to me is how directly studio and a school relates to Art for Justice. And I think, you know, before I thought, oh, well, that's this one program. And now we have this new thing. And just to help me be more brief than I usually am, I want to quote one of my twins who's now 21 and a couple of years ago or a year ago, when he saw the first rough cut of the film, he said to me, you know, if we'd, if we'd had studio in a school everywhere in the country, we wouldn't have, if, you know, for the last 40 years, we wouldn't have needed art for justice. And to me, that's really the future looking like, how do we acknowledge that giving people the tools to communicate, to think for themselves, all the things Maria is talking about, I caught quickly in the chat, someone saying, how do we make the walls porous? Maria is someone who can tell us about that, who can teach us about that. Even the couple of little clips we have in the movie that where you see her work, it's like such a revelation of this projection on the walls and people on the outside, seeing people on the inside and what that does to us. So I think that when studio in a school, when he says, the grown up student says, you know, it taught me how to look into chaos and see a pattern. And, and art can help us see the patterns that have gotten us to this day and then help us see the patterns to answer your question, help us see the patterns. What do we do going forward? I would just, for me, abolition is the clear goal of the movie. It seems like a lofty big goal, but I think if you start with where we are in the movie, you look at the patterns that are taking us there where people are given some you know, dignity, um, ability to survive, ability to commune and be in love and feel love and feel loved. Um, you know, all of those things are part of abolition. Maria also, I think all of us have talked about family and love and art being a basis for how we live. And we have a short little lives here. And like, how can we not only make the most of our lives, but make the most of other people's lives? There's so many people whose lives are being thrown mm -hmm. away, um, being buried alive, being held in cages for decades. And, mm -hmm. and those are artists, those are scientists, those are people who could have helped us over the last 50 years get to a better place now, or last hundreds, but yeah. yeah. Everybody's Chad, I see another film in the works for you in the very near future. So thank you. Um, Maria, call to action in just a couple of phrases. Wow, okay. <laughs> that was so beautiful what, what Kat just shared. Um, something that I've been thinking about time and time and again, especially now, it feels ever more clear is that 
I, I feel like everything we do, whether it's, you know, teaching or, or working in whatever field we're working in, I think we have to, it, we have to lead with justice. I think uh, justice and love have to be sort of the, the, the compass forward um, and, and, and everything kind of you know, follows that. And I think it's ever more clear right now for me. Thank you, Zyveria. And I love what everyone said. And I'll just quickly add that I think we have to measure our, we have to sit like we're all doing. First, acknowledge that we have a gift right now that we can be this here like this. <laughs> like, you know, we've got a, a community of people, A, on the streets, uh, a large group, primarily black men <laughs> who descend from slavery on the streets throughout this country. And then we also have a group of people, primarily black men who are incarcerated inside um, that can't do what we are doing simply right here. So I think everyone has a charge right now, even between us to breathe for a second. And then in that breath, understand your proximity to some language. And for me, that there's a few words that you, that I feel like have helped me understand where I am and what the call is. You know, one, as Catherine said, you know, what is your proximity to the language around abolition? What is your proximity to the language around creativity and art making? What is your proximity around um, in narratives around incarceration? What is your proximity to repair? What is your proximity to joy, family, care, uh, again, abolition, of course, reparations. Um, and then what is your proximity to resources? And how can you start to define all of those things for yourself? We all have to do it every day. It's repetition. Um, every day, question your proximity to and what you're going to do about it and how much you need to learn. And I, and then we all have to do it. And I, and I lastly will say that for me to understand the narrative of this country is the greatest gift you could give yourself, like to really get some fundamental, you know, readings down where you're just like, Oh, I get it now. This is why it looks the way it does. Because every day, every time I've gone to Aggie's house, when I've gone for dinner, I receive a book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Those books are, have taught me so much, you know, whether it be a poetry book, whether it be an art history book, whether it be a narrative. And I think we all have access to, to, to so much. And so it's what's your proximity to information and how are you going to take it in? How are you going to, and then how is it going to move you? Mm -hmm. Wow like 95 calls to action there. That's good. Thank you, Siberia. Uh, Terrence, really quickly, last one, then we'll hear the audience questions. Yeah, sure. I'll, I will try to follow all those beautiful words that everyone's spoken, you know, I'll echo that same sentiment. You know, I think my call to action is very simple. It's to make room for justice in our lives every single day, right? I believe the most powerful part of the film and Agnes as a person um, it's her ability to make change within herself. So, you know, there's someone who um, exposed themselves to the reality of injustice, you know, in our criminal legal system, reflected on it, educated herself and committed to bring injustice, not only into her own world, but like the world. Um, and I think, you know, this year has been so tough on all of us. It's brought on, you know, so much pain and trauma. I think, you know, we have to really take a moment for ourselves to breathe uh, like Xaveria said, and, you know, it, to grieve and reflect on what we've experienced and what we lost um, and interrogate within ourselves, you know, how we can bring more justice into our own day to day lives. And, you know, it may not be with the painting. It may not be like, you know, the profession that you choose or that you're in, um, but it, you know, can just be simply how we interact with the people in our own world and community, you know, our friends and our family. And I think most importantly, you know, strangers that we don't know um, who we share space with. So that is ultimately uh, my call to action today. Thank you so much, Terrence. Great. And I know there's a lot of um, good thoughts percolating here. So Jane has been actively monitoring the chat and has compiled a few of the questions. Um, 
Let's hear up a couple questions. I also just want to mention um, we are going to um, honor your time and end officially at one o'clock. However, our speakers have very graciously agreed to stick around for a few more minutes for some unofficial office hours. If anybody would like to um, continue to be in conversation and hear those questions, but you should all feel free to drop off at the hour if you all um, need to. So thank you for that. Jane, let's hear your questions. Yeah, so many good questions um, coming through. I'm going to start with one that is a, that is many. One question that is many um, from Claire Rice, who's the executive director of Arts Alliance Illinois. Thanks for being here, Claire. <clears throat> she says, "So grateful for this opportunity to hear. Excuse me, <clears throat> to hear from these extraordinary artists and be in community with all of you as we talk about resources and building on Zyveria's comments." How do we reconcile some of the traditional, less Aggie-influenced funding mechanisms of the art world? How does this A for J community continue to push and influence those collectors and donors who may disagree with the fundamental principles of this work? Is it about inviting them in, bring them along with love, and or at what point do we say simply do we say we simply don't want or need them anymore? How do we encourage cultural institutions? to stand up to those donors and or refuse their dollars? Do y'all have strategies and plans in these types of complicated spaces? Great, thanks for that, Clara. There was a lot in that question. Who would like to try to tackle that in like 35 seconds, 34, 40 seconds? <laughs> I'm going to, I'll say two things. Um, one is just that there is decolonize this place. There are a lot of people who are talking about the responsibility of people within the art world and who are being very active and very successful. I would raise up one of our grantee partners, Bianca Tylek from uh, Worth Rises. And maybe Terrence or Leanne want to add, or Amy Holmes is on here, um, want to add, uh, something else about how we do it. But I think Aggie did it as a, as a model from the beginning, from the very start, she asked other people to join her. There's over 30 other founding donors to the Art for Justice Fund. Some are couples, so there's actually more than 30. Um, and ever since then, um, a lot of people have also participated. I think it's about modeling it. Even when we started this just a few years ago, there was not nearly as many organizations, people and money in this field of criminal justice reform and there's tons more now, not enough obviously, but there's more and more and more. So I think you can't focus on the people you can't change. I think we just keep talking about what kind of philanthropy are we talking about? What do we wanna do? How do we model it? And how do we really truly understand the root cause problem with philanthropy, which is that it's founded on economic inequality. The idea is that some people have more than they need and too many people have not what they need, not enough. And it, until we actually try to change that, which would put philanthropy out of business, then we're not actually doing the work that we want to do. And I think that's why Bianca has been able to be successful because if you call out, that is too old fashioned, it's just too wrong. Anyway, any other great art for justice um, folks, Leanne or Terrence or Amy want to speak to bringing other donors along? I know that's not the only question, part of that question. But. Yeah, I think I can I can quickly touch on it. I mean, I think it's exactly what Kat said, right? Like Agnes and Kat and the fund have committed to continuously bringing in the rest of the, the art world, right? So we we constantly, uh, you know, instead of just circling ourselves in the CJ community, I think Agnes does a great job of stepping back to the art world and you know showing this as a model of what we can do within that space, right? Um, you know, last year, uh, Grant Makers in the Art Conference happened um, in Denver. And, you know, for the first time, I think they had a, a criminal justice leg or they had Art for Justice be honored, right? Um, and so, you know, I think she constantly does that work on her own and it constantly brings the fund into those different, um, you know, art spaces to do that work. Um, and so that's been an incredible example, I think, the artists, you know, within our community have also done a fantastic job, right? Like there, we have examples of artists who, you know, receive grants or fellowships from the fund who, you know, ended up, you know, making money off their own art and then donated back to the fund some of that, you know, revenue from, the, from their very own art sales. So it's constantly revisiting that world or, or not leaving it in the first place and then, you know, serving as a model for what other artists can do within that space, right? Like everyone doesn't have to sell, 
you know, a multi-million dollar painting. It's just like what they can do within their own practice to continue to move the needle, to continue to push um, on other artists in the space. And I think, um, you know, we've done a really good job with that over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terrence. Jane, let's take another question. We recognize some folks may need to drop off, which we totally understand. This um, program is being recorded and we'll make it available in its entirety. So if you have to go, don't have FOMO, you can kind of catch the great questions. There've also been so many great questions in the chat. Um, we'll be sure to try to find a way to address them. But Jane, what's next? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us another um, multifaceted question um, that I think you know, all of the panelists will have a lot to say about. So this is from Maria Spont Lemus. Um, she says, if this was not addressed in the film, apologies, I just signed up this morning and only saw the beginning of it. Uh, has the group probed together questions like, where does this or other philanthropic money come from? What conditions created and continue to create such immense wealth to begin with? In what ways might philanthropy or celebrating philanthropy reproduce interconnected slash underlying problems of racist capitalism and patronage relationships in the arts, even as it supports these incredible artists and activists doing this incredible work toward justice. Wondering if anyone is willing to speak to those or related tensions and complexities. I will briefly, I'll try to be brief. Um, part of the answer to that question is looking at the continued extraction that philanthropists are involved with, that often the philanthropists are, are, are still, um, even if they give a little bit of money over here, they're still invested in, or, or you know, as we just recently saw, people are invested in, in the phones in prisons, extracting inordinate amounts of money from, from black and brown families who are desperate to stay connected to their incarcerated family and loved ones. Um, we have to look at that, at the, at the extraction that it's the money's coming from, but I think also, and this is posed in Winners Take All, which I'm sure some people are familiar with, is the question of how do we um, stop taking? In, instead of only looking at how we give the people who have so much, to stay, say, we're not gonna take from the communities anymore. One really important aspect, I don't know if people um, got from this already about Art for Justice is that it's a five year spend down. And I feel like in that sense, it's addressing some of these issues that Xavier was raising about reparations. It's not saying, oh, here's this hundred million, we're gonna pay our staff and we're gonna live, you know, keep making these decisions for years and years in, a, in an endowment that perpetuates. Instead, it's saying we've got a hundred million dollars. We got to get it into the field. People need it. People are deserve it. It's resources that can be put to work to address the inequities that that created it in the first place. I feel like that's one of the ways to address that issue. Thank you, um, Maria or Zaviria. Any thoughts on that? I mean, I'll just quickly say, you know, this is this is. You know, this is the question. It's it's one that Kat and I have spent time <laughs> over coffee, and I'm like, ah, and she's like, ah, you know what I mean? This is this is you know, it's difficult because at the end of the day, um, we all have benefited the all of us, no matter if you got here last year or five years ago or fifty years ago or you've been here for centuries. There's a foundational narrative that we have to understand that we've all benefited from a the extraction of resources from a, a multi-nation uh, indigenous population and obviously 300 years of extractive labor. So we, we haven't, we, I think as a group of people, we haven't even gotten there as a country to understand what the hell that means. And then, you know, and then we're trying to jump from that conversation to like, how did you, how come you have so many resources? So I think we, there's so many conversations to have in between until we get to that. And I also want to say in terms of, let's say, you know, with, with Kat and Aggie and the guns, it's like, they're like, they remind me of the Spike Lee's of the nineties in the sense that I remember when Spike Lee's movie first came out, um, his first school days. And I remember he was like, well, how come he didn't do this? And how come he didn't say that? And it's like, he was, the, he was one of the only ones in the 90s. We need more Aggies. We need a lot more. This family can't be the only one taking all the hits. And I think that they've done their part. You know what I mean? They've done their thing. So we need more. We need a lot of people on this call to start 
talking about the resources and how it's, you know what I mean? So they can tell their narrative. It shouldn't rest on one family to really do this kind of labor for a country that, you know, millions of white people especially have benefited from for centuries. So I think it's a complicated question, but I do think it's, you know, from talking to Kat many, many times and Aggie many, you know, it's, it's complicated, but it's all labor that we have to do together with care, of course, because we actually love these people at the same time. So we have to deal with all of the, all of the things that make humans human. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we could clearly be here all day, but um, because we know we um, have other things we need to get to to do the good work that you're all challenging us to do. Jane, I'm going to just have you read the two last questions together and then just ask each of our panelists just to touch on whichever part you feel most, um, you know, resonant to respond to. Okay. Yes. These are both, both directed somewhat a cat, but I, I have no doubt our panelists will be able to um, say some very interesting things as well. I, I, and my computer is frozen. No, it's not anymore. Don't worry. Okay, so we have one question. Kat, at the end of your film, you ask your mother what she thought of the film, and she asks you which film. If she did act, excuse me, if she did eventually share with you what she thought of the film, could you speak a little bit about that? What a remarkable life she has led is leading so many rich experiences and such a huge impact on others, artists, museums, school children, art educators, and now the criminal justice system. But I'd still love to know what she thought of your film. Um, a second question, oh, I'm sorry, there are three. Another question was for Maria. How do we make these walls more porous? Thank you for saying that, Maria. I'd love to hear how you're able to navigate and push on this right now teaching, collaborating, co-creating with people inside during the pandemic. And a last question from John Bennett. Kat, tell us a bit about Jason Moran's involvement in the project and about the role of music in a film that focuses on visual art and social justice. Maria, do you wanna go first? Yes, um, I was uh, just thinking about some of the folks on this, on this call and I think that question came from um, Aji Petty, who works with the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Project. And I think they're renamed Prison and Neighborhood Arts and Education Project. Um, I saw Monica Trinidad on this call and, and she's from um, the For the People Artists Collective. Um, Jackie Summel is here from Solitary Gardens. And I feel like these three uh, educators and artists and activists are part of groups or, or individually are doing some amazing work to make the walls porous. And I think that I guess my the best answer I can say is, you know, look at their work. Um, if we're thinking about, you know, uh, in car, you know, carceral uh, space as not just being within, you know, the confines of these institutions, but also, uh, you know, impacting communities. Um, you know, uh, Kat just talked about economic inequality. Um, you know, uh, Siberia talked about, you know, uh, racism and, uh, you know, black communities and, uh, you know, brown communities. And so I'm thinking about like all of these ways that we can kind of make the walls porous as a sort of metaphor for lots of different kinds of inequities that we're um, dealing with right now. That's beautiful. Um, I am gonna jump to the Jason one first, which uh, is, is Jason Moran, it, there's all this kind of, beautiful internal coherence to me about this film and how it got made and who worked on it and what you know the fact that Xiveria and I are so close but she also has this relationship with Aggie and like you could feel that you knew that was true in her scene and Jason actually did the soundtrack for not only Selma but for 13. So the, the fact that his sensibility and his music was in there it was amazing to work with him if people don't know his work he's He's just, you know, it's not my art form. So um, I just feel in awe of it all the time. You know, I would say that in the nitty gritty, the uh, composer works very closely with the editor and the director. Um, he was super generous with his time and his skills. And I'll give one example is that the scene where Aggie is going around the show at MoMA, the show of the artwork that she's donated. And that scene used to be much later in the movie for a very different reason. And it had this very languish, languish, languid 
um, music that was, you know, I really wanted people to be able to see the art. So I had kept these shots very long on the art so you could sort of meditate and get brought in with this music. When we realized, you know, narratively, we had to move that scene among every other scene. And that ended up very much in the beginning of the film. We suddenly had to make it a really fast moving. It was at the beginning when you're still trying to get people all this information really fast so that they can, you know, pay, pay attention to and take in the, the full narrative as they go. So he, he just came up with this other kind of music. So that it's a great question. Music is a time-based art form that it gets laid across our time-based art form of film. Um, it's a real privilege to get to work with that kind of medium. And what does Aggie think? I would say that I've kind of like, I think I've worn her down and she's very happy the film is out there because, um, because it's helping spread the word about criminal justice reform, the need to fight anti-Black racism and the legacies of slavery. And, and I think the reality that art gives us a bigger world um, and you know that that's a place we should all be heading. And, and so I think she appreciates that, but she hates having a movie made about her for sure. <laughs> Thank you all. That feels like a perfect place to come in for a landing. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists. There were We want to get a transcript and be able to read and pour over these words again, because there's just so much there. Um, so thank you for sharing part of your afternoon with us to everybody. And Jane is going to close us out. Can I just say one thing? <laughs> Shout out. There's an amazing article. Um, Kat's not talking about it, but it's such a dope article. Um, in Essence, so Essence.com, um, written by Asha Bandali. That is, I mean, if you want to really know who this person is, who's the daughter of that person and her community, I mean, that article is short. Go Essence.com, Catherine. It, they just give it to you straight. That's, that's what we're talking about. Thank you for posting that in the chat, Terrence. Thank you so much. And um, I, yes, as May, as May said, thank you all so, so much for joining us today for this conversation with Catherine Gund, Maria Gaspar, Terrence Bogans, Siberia Simmons, and May Hong. Um, huge thanks to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's Department of Exhibitions and Exhibition Studies for partnering with us to bring you this program. I wanna say a huge thank you to my wonderful colleague, Tyrese Williams for his production and programming prowess. Um, thank, and thank you to all of my colleagues at Illinois Humanities for helping make today possible. Um, Kat, thank you for making Aggie and giving us so much rich content to discuss. And of course, we send enormous thanks to your mother, Agnes Gund and the many phenomenal people behind the Art for Justice Fund who are truly making the world a more just and better place. Um, we do have some more exciting programming coming up at Illinois Humanities, notably on November 11th, it's a Wednesday, we have an Envisioning Justice Rapid Response event that will feature curation from several more members of the Art for Justice community as we examine and explore whatever the world may look like in the wake of the national election. So please go to ilhumanities.org to sign up for our newsletter and stay tuned for more information. And thank you all so, so much. Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>